Joining us now is former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Understanding Trump. Mr. Speaker, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. So I think you understand the president. I don't understand why he would get in the way of what is a successful and needed message, soft nationalism, soft populism, with a distraction like this. He is an instinctive gut fighter. It bred into him probably by dealing with page six in New York in the 1980s. Uh, it is so deep in his psyche that you hit him, he punches you. He doesn't think it would be good to punch you, it would be bad to punch you, he punches you. And uh, look, I don't defend some of the stuff he does. I've, I've told him to his face. I think that I love about 80% of his tweets. We negotiated, I got up to 90. But the last 10% is hopeless. And it's just who he is. It's, you know, in many ways, he's an extraordinary historic figure. In some ways, you wonder, why does he undercut himself? Uh, and maybe eventually he'll learn not to do it. But it's integral to his personality. You hit him, he's going to hit you back. Is there someone in the White House who works for him, with, who has authority there, with a clear list of the objectives he articulated on the campaign? And by the way, the other night, when he uh, spoke in Iowa, keep the country out of pointless foreign wars, restore the middle class, jobs. Yeah. Do you think they're focused on those things? Look, I, th I think 98% of the time, President Trump gets focused. He, he wants to make America great again. It's not just a slogan. He wants to create jobs. He wants to reform uh, regulations. He wants to fix the health system. He wants to fix the tax system. And then about 2% of the time, he goes back to being the Donald Trump who used to be, uh, you know, a private businessman saying whatever he wanted to. And the 2% of time, of course, in the media world, blows up and takes up almost half the space. Right. No, there's, which, there's no question about that. It is given disproportionate attention by people who are already opposed to his agenda and who sure. also are shallow and in a lot of cases dumb. But people who aren't dumb and who have supported him and who I think hear kind of the, the policy dog whistle that he was emitting for the last few years are concerned about the number of Goldman Sachs people, for example, in the White House who don't seem to understand the agenda at all and maybe working at cross purposes against it. Do you think that's a fair concern? Sure. I, look, I think it's fair to say, like every White House, there's tension. Yeah. You know, in the Reagan White House, which is now romanticized, Jim Baker came from one direction, you know, Ed Meese came from another, Mike Deaver came from another, the National Security Council came from a fourth direction, Reagan presided over the whole thing. Um, and Reagan, in the end, made the decisions. The same thing's happening here. They brought in a lot of really smart people from many different directions. I mean, people talk about Goldman Sachs, and they've had a, certainly a lot of alumni there. On the other hand, I mean, even Steve Bannon, ironically. So here's yes. Bannon, who's the nationalist, but he's a Goldman Sachs That's alumni. That's true. You know, uh, it's partly a tribute to how good Goldman Sachs is. It's the, it's the Harvard of, of uh, financial investing. Uh, on the other hand, in the end, it comes down to one person. And like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln or Ronald Reagan, that one person has a pretty good sense of where he wants to go. And Trump routinely runs over everybody, routinely imposes his will, and gets them back on track, which is a very bold, very dramatic, and profoundly transformational direction. That's reassuring from a man who understands Trump. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Good to see you.